on World News Tonight. Bloody battles. Russia pushes to cross the last resistance in Mariupol. The attack continues in the steel plant where hundreds of civilians are still trapped. Grim milestone. New reports for the World Health Organization was released unraveling new and shocking figures of the global COVID-19 death toll. Dramatic testimony. Amber Heard details an abuse allegation against ex-husband Johnny Depp in his defamation suit against her. And it's Legoland. The doors of the much-anticipated amusement park opens for the fun lovers after a hard lockdown. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We continue tonight with updates on the Ukraine-Russia conflict. President Vladimir Zelensky said in a video address to a medical charity group that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has devastated hundreds of hospitals and other institutions and left doctors without drugs to tackle cancer or the ability to perform surgery. Zelensky said many places lacked even basic antibiotics in eastern and southern Ukraine, the focal points of the fighting. Fighting intensified Thursday in Mariupol as explosions continue to pulverize the besieged Azovstal steelworks plant where the last of the city's defenders are holed up, as well as what's believed to be a few hundred civilians. Whilst Russia stated yesterday that Thursday would begin a three-day ceasefire and open a humanitarian corridor for civilian evacuations, Ukraine's militia fighters say that this hasn't been honored. Heavy, bloody fighting is going on. For 71 days, the defenders of the city have been fighting single-handed against overpowering enemy forces. The Russians have not kept the promise of ceasefire and have not given an opportunity for the civilians who seek shelter from the fire in basements of the plant to evacuate. Moscow, however, has outright denied any storming of the steelworks. Our president and supreme commander, President Putin, publicly gave the order to refrain from launching an assault on the Azovstal plant. No other orders have been announced. This comes amid growing suspicions that President Putin may be trying for battlefield success by the 9th of May. Russia's annual victory parade and the biggest patriotic holiday on the Russian calendar, marking the Soviet Union's triumph over Nazi Germany. As well as suggestions he may escalate military action, possibly even declaring an all-out war, which so far the Kremlin has denied. The capture of Azovstal and the fall of the major port city would be a strong strategic win for Moscow, establishing a land corridor to Crimea, which it seized in 2014. Now moving on to the latest on the COVID crisis, the World Health Organization believes almost 15 million people around the world have died from complications linked to COVID-19 over the past two years. The figure given out by the WHO is nearly triple the official death toll. The agency's data showed Southeast Asia, Europe and the Americas accounted for most of the fatalities. The official death toll from the first two years of the coronavirus pandemic is about 5.4 million. But according to a new World Health Organization report, the actual number is around three times higher. The UN body said on Thursday there were 14.9 million excess deaths associated with COVID-19 by the end of 2021. Excess deaths are the number of deaths that occurred beyond the number expected in non-pandemic years. One reason for the jump, deaths that were missed in countries without adequate reporting. Even pre-pandemic, around 6 in 10 deaths around the world were not registered, according to the WHO. William Sambori is with the WHO's Department of Data and Analytics. We do need better data. So one of the reasons why we focus on the excess mortality is because we know the, the, the testing data is inconsistent across countries. And we know that there are many people who died before they were tested. So we do need death certificate data to ascertain uh, the, the cause of death uh, attribution in more detail. The report said almost half of the deaths not counted until now were in India, suggesting 4.7 million people died there as a result of the pandemic so far, well beyond India's count of less than 500,000. The WHO panel of international experts have been working on the data for months. They used national and local information, as well as statistical models, to estimate totals, a methodology that India has criticized. The new number also includes deaths indirectly related to COVID-19, 
such as those who could not access health care for other conditions when systems were overwhelmed during huge waves of infection. It also accounts for deaths averted during the pandemic, for example, because of the lower risk of traffic accidents during lockdowns. In a statement Thursday, the WHO called the data sobering and said that it highlights, quote, the need for all countries to invest in more resilient health systems that can sustain essential health services during crises. The FDA has put in new limits on Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine because of a rare blood clotting and bleeding issue. And as the U.S. surpasses 1 million COVID deaths, there are new concerning signs with cases, hospitalizations and deaths all rising again. Tonight, a new Omicron subvariant is fueling another COVID surge across much of the U.S. In Maine, an elementary school has shifted to remote learning after 30 percent of its students and staff got sick. Now, the CDC forecasts COVID hospitalizations and deaths will rise over the next four weeks. That comes as the COVID death toll in the U.S. climbs above one million. Dr. Yumesh Gidwani runs the cardiac ICU at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. The state's COVID hospitalizations just topped 2,000 for the first time since February. California has seen its rate of new COVID cases increase nearly 70 percent in the past two weeks. And in Seattle, a Carmel cruise ship docked this week after passengers say more than 100 people were infected. They were overwhelmed. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has tested positive just days after attending the White House Correspondents' Dinner. The nation's most distinguished super spreader event. <laughs> That event is now facing growing scrutiny as more guests test positive. And the dinner mandated proof of vaccination and a same-day negative test, though other social events in D.C. that weekend may have had more lenient requirements. The president of the White House Correspondents Association says our event implemented protocols that went beyond any guidance or regulation issued by the CDC or the D.C. Health Department. Over in Africa now, Aspen Pharmacare will switch about half of its COVID vaccine production capacity onto other products if demand doesn't pick up within six weeks, its CEO warned, as South Africa's health officials urged more Africans to take up the shots. Africa's top public health body urged all those purchasing COVID-19 vaccines for the continent to place orders with South Africa's Aspen Pharmacare. The Africa Centre for Disease Control and Prevention said it was doing everything it could behind the scenes to prevent a situation where Aspen closes its facility due to a lack of orders. Aspen CEO Stephen Saad warned that the company will switch about half of its COVID-19 vaccine production capacity onto other products if demand doesn't pick up within six weeks. The pharmaceutical company negotiated a licensing deal in November to package and sell Johnson & Johnson's COVID-19 vaccine and distribute it across Africa. There were also expectations of high demand for the firm's own brand version of the shot. This was hailed as a game-changing moment for an under-vaccinated continent frustrated by sluggish Western handouts. But Aspen's company executive said on Saturday that it had not received a single order for its Aspen Novax vaccine. It currently has the capacity to produce around 1 million vaccine doses per day. Roughly half of that is being used to fulfill a supply agreement with Johnson & Johnson. Saad added the remaining capacity, which had been expected to produce Aspen Novax shots destined for the African market, is currently sitting idle. South Africa's president, Cyril Ramaphosa, told state broadcaster SABC on Wednesday he had reached out to the governments of Zambia, Uganda, Malawi and Kenya in an attempt to drum up orders for Aspen. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. At least three people were killed in what police suspect was a Palestinian attack in the central Israel city of Elad on the country's Independence Day. Witnesses and emergency responders said the attackers used axes. An apparent attack with what witnesses say were axes or knives left three people dead in the central Israeli city of Elad on Thursday, the country's Independence Day. Police suspect it was a Palestinian attack. Witnesses and emergency responders reported that two attackers, armed with knives, axes or both, 
targeted passers-by in a park. Witness Haim Davida described the scene. My son, who was outside the building, entered inside and started shouting, terrorists are outside. We went out and we saw them attacking people. What happened? I ran to the man who had an injury in his head. I did first aid and I stopped the bleeding. The people who were here ran after the terrorists, wishing to catch them. Police set up roadblocks to try to catch the assailants who fled the scene about nine miles from Tel Aviv. Ariel Cohen, a police investigator from nearby Rosh Hain, said the search for the assailant is ongoing. We're talking about several crime scenes in the city of Elad. Right now, we are searching for the terrorists. Uh, we do not uh, have full indication uh, if it's a one terrorist or more. We are conducting a chase after him. Uh, we have a helicopter with us and we are setting roadblocks in order to catch him. Israeli Foreign Minister Yair Lapid responded on Twitter saying, quote, the joy of Independence Day was cut short in an instant. Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas condemned the attack. There have been a series of Arab attacks in recent weeks, mostly targeting civilians. Before Elad, Palestinians and members of Israel's Arab minority had killed 15 people in Israel and the West Bank. Earlier on Thursday, confrontations again broke out between Palestinians and Israeli police at Al-Aqsa Mosque, a site in Jerusalem's old city that is important in both Islam and Judaism. Jewish visitors were allowed into the area on Thursday after their entrance to the site had been suspended for the last 10 days of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. Hamas, the Islamist Palestinian group that controls Gaza, praised the attack but did not claim responsibility. It also said that the Elad attack was a response to Israeli actions at the al Aska Mosque. Back in the U.S. now, there is severe weather sweeping across the nation as at least one tornado was confirmed tonight coming after a night of violent storms in Texas and Oklahoma. Tonight, tornadoes tearing through Texas and Oklahoma. At least eight reported twisters in the last 24 hours. One striking in East Texas RV Park just hours ago, where officials say the storm injured two people amid a trail of destruction. In Seminole, Oklahoma, a brutal deja vu. The town already hit hard by a tornado Monday, suffering through a second twister. One teacher sharing the terrifying moments her family hid inside a school vault. It, it felt like a train. My, my little boys were screaming. It was, uh, it was definitely scary. In Texas, another nightmare. A storm hidden by nightfall, making a direct hit on the town of Lockett. In a sudden turn, the tornado caught a storm chasing tour bus, blasting out its windows with six people still inside. The White House president says U.S. President Joe Biden will reaffirm his country's commitment to defending South Korea and Japan during his trip to the region later this month. Biden's defense chief also reiterating Washington's ironclad will to maintain the defense of South Korea with the total scope of U.S. military power. U.S. President Joe Biden will reaffirm Washington's commitment to the defense of South Korea and Japan during a visit to the two countries later this month. White House spokesperson Jen Psaki said in a briefing on Thursday that U.S. commitments, including on extended deterrence, remain ironclad. Biden will sit down for talks with the leaders of South Korea and Japan to discuss their common challenges and tasks, among them strengthening security alliances and coping with the pandemic. Pointing out Pyongyang's continuous activities have caused instability in the region, Psaki added North Korea issues will also be on the agenda. In fact, U.S. Defense Chief Lloyd Austin reaffirmed a U.S. commitment to defending Seoul using the full range of U.S. military capabilities, including extended deterrence. During Austin's a phone call with South Korea's Defense Minister Hulk on Thursday, the two sides reviewed the North's recent flurry of missile activity and vowed to closely cooperate to enhance their combined defense posture. Also on Thursday, the U.S. Senate unanimously approved the nomination of Philip Goldberg as the new ambassador to South Korea. He's expected to be officially appointed by President Joe Biden soon and kick off his career in Seoul with Biden's upcoming visit to South Korea. Goldberg, a Korea ambassador, is currently serving as ambassador to Colombia and also served as a coordinator for implementation of the UN Security Council resolution on North Korea during the Obama administration. The wait has finally been put to rest as days of hinting have now led to Elon Musk revealing Twitter's brand new CEO as himself. Shares for Twitter and Tesla saw major dips and rises as new information on all potential investors for the app also caused ripples in the community.
Shares of Twitter rallied while Tesla shares plunged with the rest of the stock market Thursday after CNBC reported that Elon Musk may be the temporary CEO of the social media company. Musk, the world's richest man, is also CEO at Tesla and heads two other ventures, The Boring Company and SpaceX. Earlier on Thursday, Musk said in a filing he had secured just over $7 billion in funding from a group of investors, including billionaire Oracle co-founder Larry Ellison, to fund Musk's $44 billion takeover of Twitter. The filing also showed that Saudi Arabian investor Prince Al-Walid bin Talal, who had initially opposed the buyout, also agreed to roll his almost $2 billion stake into the deal rather than cashing out. Musk will continue to hold talks with existing shareholders of Twitter, including the company's former chief, Jack Dorsey, to contribute shares to the proposed acquisition. Larry Ellison, a board member at Tesla and a self-described close friend of Musk, has committed $1 billion for the funding. Meanwhile, Tesla shares were down more than 7% in Thursday morning trading, indicating that investors were concerned about Musk's increased involvement in Twitter. Shares of Twitter extended gains but were still shy of Musk's offer of $54.20. Actor Johnny Depp's $50 million defamation lawsuit against his ex-wife Amber Heard continues in a Virginia courtroom. Heard took the stand for the second day detailing the abuse she says she was victim of. However, Depp's legal team says she was the abuser. <laughs> Actress Amber Heard broke down in tears on the witness stand Thursday as she told a jury that ex-husband Johnny Depp sexually assaulted her with a liquor bottle and threatened to kill her about a month after their wedding. But I couldn't get up. Testifying in a widely watched defamation trial, Heard said she visited Depp in Australia in early 2015 when he was filming the fifth Pirates of the Caribbean movie and shared with the jury disturbing details of their first evening together in what she said was an argument that turned violent. He shoves me up against the fridge. Uh, he has me by the throat. Depp was belligerent, according to Heard, and threw bottles that broke all around her. But at some point he had a broken bottle. Uh, up against my face, neck area, by my jawline, and he told me he'd carve up my face. Then, according to Heard, Depp took one of the bottles and pushed it inside her. I felt this pressure. I felt this pressure. <laughs> he, oh, my pubic bone. And I remember her that just not wanting to move because I didn't know if it was broken. I didn't know if the bottle that he had inside me was broken. Do you recall what Mr. Depp was saying to you when he had the bottle and was pushing it against your pubic bone? He said that, um, uh, that he would f kill me. F kill you. In earlier testimony, Depp offered a different account of the incident in Australia. She threw the large bottle and it made contact. Saying Heard was the person who hurled objects during their argument, hitting him with a vodka bottle that severed the top of his right middle finger. Depp also testified that he never hit Heard and that she was the abuser. She kicked the bathroom door into my head. On Thursday, Heard described to the jury a tumultuous relationship of both love and violence. He was awful and toxic, but it was so important to me, and I loved him so much. I Depp is suing his ex-wife for $50 million, saying she defamed him when she claimed she was the victim of domestic abuse. Heard has countersued for $100 million, arguing Depp smeared her by calling her a liar. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A series of dust storms across central and southern Iraq resulted in thousands of Iraqis going to hospitals and clinics to seek treatment for breathing problems and halted air traffic for a few hours at the storm's peak. Germany will end its participation in European Union training mission in Mali, but is ready to continue with a UN peacekeeping mission in the country under certain conditions, Defence Minister Christine Lambrecht said. 
President Joe Biden said he has chosen Karine Jean-Pierre to be White House Press Secretary, succeeding Jen Psaki and becoming the first black and openly gay person to serve as a public face of U.S. administration. Authorities in Fiji have seized a $300 million yacht of Russian oligarch Suleim and Kerimov at the request of the United States. The U.S. requested Fiji to seize the superyacht as its allies impose sanctions on Russia over its invasion of Ukraine, which Russia calls a special military operation. India objected to the World Health Organization's estimates of excess COVID-19 deaths in the country. The WHO report said that almost half of the deaths that until now had not been counted were in India. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. In case you've missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. The highly anticipated global amusement park Legoland have now opened their doors, letting visitors into a world of wonderment. We're leaving you tonight with visuals of fun lovers entering the land of excitement. Thank you for watching. Good night.